this morning as he shares his heart with us. And um, Father, I pray um, that we would be tenderhearted to hear what you're um, saying to us as a congregation. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Good morning. Sorry to leave you hanging there. (laughs) Lord, thank you for your presence. We just cannot say enough how much we value it, Father. It is so good. Even though um, we have a testimony of you coming when we gather, it's so good to do it again and discover all anew that you meet us when we reach for you. It is so good, Lord. Keep coming. Don't take your presence from us. Amen. Let's go to Amos. Amos 8. I believe the Lord highlighted this as to bring this out for right now. We're talking a little bit about a vision for this place and this moment in time. Um, and a bunch of stuff we prayed and sang about just now. <laughs> Amos 8, thus the Lord God showed me, behold, a basket of summer fruit. And if you're anything like me, you're like, oh, that's nice. That's a nice picture. And he said, Amos, what do you see? So I said, a basket of summer fruit. Okay, yeah. Everybody likes a basket of summer fruit, right? Then the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people Israel, and I will not pass by them anymore. And the songs of the temple shall be wailing in that day, says the Lord God, many dead bodies everywhere. They shall be thrown out in silence. Like, this is not what I think of as summer fruit. And so suddenly the summer fruit changes, right? Summer fruit is the fruit that lasts a very short moment. Stephanie is a fan of buying raspberries and blackberries (laughs) and sticking them in the fridge. And then if we don't eat them, even refrigerated with the, you know, power of modern technology, like in an instant, they're falling apart and covered in fuzz. (laughs) <laughs> invisible guffaw from Elisha because he, he has seen the falling apart covered in fuzz. Um, and that's the picture here, right? It's summer fruit. And I'm just imagining, like, you know, they had techniques. They had, had what, cool rooms to stick things in and stuff like that, but nothing like a refrigerator. So how long must the fragile berries have lasted in the middle of summer heat in Israel? It was like, you eat it now or it's gone. And he's saying it's, it's rotten, right? That's this vision here. Um, the end has come upon my people Israel and I will pass by them, not pass by them anymore. Songs of the temple shall be wailing in that day, says the Lord God. Many dead bodies everywhere and they shall be thrown out in silence. I'm imagining like this, this is a people who are taking care of their dead and they are just so weary of it. There are so many dead that like the wailing has run out because there's a certain point where you just, everything shuts down and you just have to get rid of the dead bodies, right? It's bleak. And then he goes into why. Hear this, you who swallow up the needy and make the poor of the land fail, saying, when will the new moon be passed that we may sell grain and the Sabbath that we may trade wheat? The new moon marks the new, uh, new month, and it's a day of rest just like the weekly Sabbath is. So they're basically saying, hey, we have to take this time off um, to observe the statutes of God, and it means we can't sell things, and we're, um, we're annoyed. Like, we are losing productivity time. I actually saw a news article 
about how much productivity was lost, you know, like they're counting the millions of dollars lost because people went outside in the middle of the day to look at the eclipse last week. Like, that that was weighed against, you know, this, this sign in the sky, this wonder that is not common and that still, you know, it has to be counted out in terms of like, what could we have made and sold in that time? Making the ephah small and the shekel large, falsifying the scales by deceit that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, even sell the bad wheat. So it's not just like, oh, that was opportunity to do commerce. It was opportunity to do commerce, shifty commerce, where we're losing out on opportunities to like weigh the scales in our favor to get a little bit of extra. And I talked a while back, the Lord gave me a message about like how many different ways this is happening that we just accept because it's just the way we do things. Um, just trying to lean on the scales a little bit, bring in a little bit more. And then even selling the bad wheat. It's like, we've even got this rotten stuff we could probably get in a little return on if we just didn't have to take Saturdays off and once a month to observe the Lord's statutes. And so the Lord has a controversy with Israel in this passage because it's like that this is how they perceive these days of rest that were given to them for rest. Um, not only do they mourn that they have to rest, but that they can't do evil in them. <laughs> and uh, just noting the, the spoil, the bad wheat there is like, Here's this summer fruit, rotten, right? And uh, even this rotten fruit, this grain that has gone bad, um, we're looking to like, hey, we could make a little money off of that, which is just in context of like what I'm going to be talking about here. Um, just to note that there is a trade in bad wheat. Um, not all food that's for sale is healthy food. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I'll never forget any of their works. Shall the land not tremble for this and every one mourn who dwells in it? And of it shall swell like the river, heave and subside. All of it, sorry. Of, shall swell like the river, heave and subside like the river of Egypt. So um, we've got a essentially earthquake here, depicted the, the earth buckling like the river Egypt swelling in its season when it gets rains and then going back down again. And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I'll make the sun go down at noon and I'll darken the earth in broad daylight, speaking of eclipses. I'll turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I'll bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I'll make it like mourning for an only sun and its end like a bitter day. Um, so there are re very real judgments. Um, I, I shouldn't even say that. There are very physical judgments. Uh, but I'm going to be talking about a spiritual judgment, and Amos does as he continues on. Um, and I just want to say not to discount actual famine, which is prophesied, and actual food. But in this case, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I'll send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of God, but the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. Um, this is always like a weird thing to kind of think of. So basically, I really feel like the Lord is saying, this is now, right? That the, the word of the Lord is disappearing at a very quick rate where you can find it, which is very odd in a culture saturated with scripture. And I'm going to try to contrast here a little bit between scripture and the word of the Lord, even though the scripture is the word of the Lord. Um, and I'll try to, uh, to make that clear. Unpack it. There, there's a good phrase. Thank you. Um, but, you know, like, there's, there's a Bible in every hotel room. 
like our language is full of things that come out of biblical phrases that we use and that the world doesn't even realize that this is actually a, a piece of, a, of scripture that is just entered into our language and we use it constantly. Um, our literature, uh, our stories are so heavily based on scripture and we don't even recognize it anymore, you know. Um, one of my favorite examples that <laughs> uh, gave Tom some trouble is the Matrix, you know, is filled with biblical imagery, even though it was not created by believers um, and it was not created to glorify God, just because we're so saturated in it. So how do you have a famine of the word of the Lord in a culture that is dripping stuffed full with scripture from the Bible. And I'll, I'll get into that. Um, they shall wander from sea to sea, north from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. And this is something that has really stood out to me um, ever since COVID, is how much people constantly look around for other people to emulate. Like, who has the wisdom? Like, this is what I saw all during COVID lockdown. It's like, can we find the expert who's doing the, like, like the, every business was looking for the business that's a little bit bigger than mine that I'm kind of the smaller version of because they must know what the right thing is to do and I'll figure out what their policy is and then I'll follow that policy because that must be wisdom. Like it, was, it was a massive looking left and right for like who's got the right answer to this right now. Um, and, and, and wonderfully, the judgment causes people to go searching for the word of the Lord, right? But in the judgment, uh, in this judgment of the famine of the Lord, Many, many, many do not find it because they run left and right, um, looking in all of the wrong places. Because of the famine of the word of the Lord right now, we have to be very circumspect in, look, in finding sources for the word of the Lord. We can't just go to everybody on the internet who says, yay Jesus, and then starts expounding truth without talking to the Lord about, like, is this, you know, can't, we can't pick up every book off of back when there were Christian bookstores before the one Christian bookstore disappeared. Um, you know, you could, you, even then, you couldn't go in there and just pull books off the shelf and be like, yep, I'm going to read this, and not and be guaranteed you're not going to get a whole load of not the word of the Lord. With a lot of scripture quoted, but not the word of the Lord. And even now, like, I just want to exhort us, encourage us into a very Holy Spirit directed. Like, there are still people preaching the word of the Lord. But there is so much that is not that... Um, we have to be in conversation with him about what sources we eat from and drink from. This goes to um, translations. Uh, there are so many, and they're proliferating. Like, they're, they're coming out like crazy, new ones. And it is good to, um, like Paula was talking about, it's good to like refresh yourself with a new translation. But there's a lot of translations out there that are not translations even, they're paraphrases. Um, and the distinction there is a translator tries to um, really keep intact what's there. And there's, there's variations without going into a lot of detail. There's variations on how much it's literal versus trying to get at the spirit of it. But there are also paraphrases which are just, I'm kind of like repackaging it on my sort of like interpretation. It's more like someone going, hey, this is what I get out of it, as opposed to you know, studiously, carefully. So um, we just need to be careful, too, in what we, like, pick up and are like, I'm going to try this now. Um, I'm going to go into that some more. Let's go to, we're going to jump to Timothy, but we're coming back to Amos. 
2 Timothy 4, 2. I want to be super careful because I am not advocating like get in a room alone and don't listen to anybody else because only the still smallest voice is the word of the Lord. And I'm not advocating, oh, just listen to, you know, like these 12 people here. And are, there are, there are, there's good word of the Lord out there. Um, I am advocating for being sober about what we take in. It's actually the way we guard our eyes and ears to like worldly media it's easy to fall into the trap of not guarding ourselves as much when it comes to something that looks like the word of the Lord because it's got some scripture or it's got a name on it that is acknowledged. Um, but we should actually be more careful, I would say. Like if, I, if some junk comes at me, it's pretty clear it's junk, right? If some junk comes at me with a lot of scripture on it, and a guy that everybody is like, this guy's great. It's a lot harder. It's, there's not an instant like, whoa, that stinks. Without being in a conversation with the Lord and going, is this real food? 2 Timothy 4.2. I just like, I loved like, as I'm preparing this and talking to the Lord, like you coming across things that connect to what some of you have been saying too. Um, and what he's been telling you. 2 Timothy 4, 2, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, enduring afflictions, to do the work of evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So Paul's writing Timothy, and he's telling him, you know, like, teach, do the work of evangelists, share the good news, while also saying, there's going to be a lot of teachers, and it's a bad thing. Like, it's, a, it's kind of a strange thing on the face. Like, I'm going to talk to you about, you need to be doing some teaching, but watch out, because people are going to be looking for teachers. But there is a, it's that same sort of running around, looking for the, the word of the Lord is scarce. I don't know that I'm hearing. I'm going to find as many different people as I can to teach me something about the word of the Lord. And he describes it as this, um, as this desperation to eat food that's not food. Which means even more so, like in the middle of the famine, those who have food to offer need to be offering it, Right? doing the work of an evangelist. Uh, hopping back to Amos 8 for the very last verse. 8.13. In that day, the fair virgins and strong men shall faint from thirst. Uh, what was that day? That day was a famine of the word of the Lord. And he's tying directly the weariness, the weakness, the um, absolute fatigue to a lack of the word of the Lord. We're going to st stay in some Amos, but just Matthew 4.4 4, um, is Jesus saying it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We are sustained by the word of the Lord. It's necessary as much as food is necessary. There is not life apart from it. So going back to Amos, I'm going to jump at um, chapter earlier to Amos 7.10. This is to look at more context. So one of the contexts he gave, that the Spirit gave through Amos in the prophecy was this buying and selling, this like our, our greed, our exploitation of the poor, has gotten to so much that we're like, we see observing the rest days of the Lord as a block. But there's a further context that leads to it that's connected in Amos 7.10. 
Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive from their own land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer, flee to the land of Judah, there eat bread and there prophesy, but never again prophesy at Bethel. For it's the king's sanctuary and it is the royal residence. This is Bethel. This is the house of God. Not the house of the king. The house of God. This is the place where Jacob saw angels ascending and descending. And the priest of the city is telling the prophet, don't prophesy here anymore. This is not the go somewhere else and share your words. The now word of the Lord that, that Amos was given is being rejected because it's too much to bear. We can't take it. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor was I son of a prophet, but I was a sheep breeder and a tender of sycamore fruit. Then the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Here is, you know, a self-acknowledged reader of sheep who is giving the word of the Lord to the king and the priest of Bethel, who should be the ones, you know, just by designated authority, carrying the word of the Lord in leadership of the nation. And God's like, I'm going to send a breeder of sheep to tell you because you don't want what I have to say. Which, this is something that happens, it's happening right now in the church in this growing famine of the Lord's Lord, of the Lord's word, is he's going to give faithful nobodies the word of the Lord because the heads, the people set up in places of authority are falling. Going back to um, what I was talking about, of the like looking at a guy and being like, hey, this is the one that everybody's like, yeah, the word of the Lord. This guy has it. We can't count on that. We have to test the spirits. We have to look for the fruit. It is possible um, as clear throughout the record of the Bible that people can have the word of the Lord and then no longer have the word of the Lord or have the word of the Lord, still continue to prophesy truth, but in a way they don't understand. And so they will interpret it wholly wrongly. Um, the high priest, knowing prophetically that Jesus was to die for the whole nation, and yet interpreting that as we must kill him. I flipped my pages prematurely, and now I'm like, where was I? Oh, yeah, okay. The word of the Lord in humble mouths, not from professionals. It is lovely that in this place um, we have no stake beyond the pleasure of the Lord and maybe an occasional, hey, good word from each other. Like, we don't have the trap of, like, if I offend people with my words, I'm going to have to go find another way to make a living here. Which is lovely. as a gift from the Lord. 
Now, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel and do not spout against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife shall be a harlot in the city. Your sons and daughters shall fall by the sword. Your land shall be divided by the survey line. You shall die in a defiled land and Israel shall surely be led away captive from his own land. So this is the chapter before the chapter about the famine of the word of the Lord. And I just want to connect these. It is the rejection of the word of the Lord of like, this is too much to bear. We don't want it. That then leads the Lord to go, okay. You sent away the prophet I sent to give you the warning. So therefore, I'm going to withdraw my word. So back there where uh, I I read Jesus saying that man does not live by bread alone. Anybody know where he was quoting from? Deuteronomy 8. I didn't know until I looked it up, so not, not to, like, put a burden on anybody. That wasn't a gotcha. Um, <laughs> Deuteronomy 8, 2. You shall remember the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, fed you with manna which you did not know nor your did fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. He fed them in the desert specifically to teach about receiving his word. Which is awesome. Like, I just, I love that when he, I love it when he spells it out, you know, because like, sometimes you have to tease it out and like listen, and he's like, okay, this is why I did this. Other times he's like, I told somebody to say, this is why I did this. <laughs> and it's like, thank you. That's, that makes things kind of direct, Lord. Um, so we're going we're gonna to read about the commandments concerning manna in Exodus 16, because he said this, I did this specifically. And just to give it context, just remembering, like, what is this, the context of eating desert, manna in the desert? It's they're being rescued out of Egypt, but why did they go to Egypt in the first place? In order to avoid a famine. They were taken into Egypt by God through Joseph in order to avoid a famine. He fed them via Egypt for a while grew them into a mighty nation, and then was like, now I'm going to take you out into the desert, and I'm going to feed you. It's all about feeding from the Lord. And then the promise is, I'm going to take you into a land where I'm going to feed you because it's rich with food. (laughs) So much about food. Uh, Exodus 16, 16. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man gather manna according to each one's need. One omer for each person according to the number of persons. Let every man take for those who are in his tent. Um, One thing that struck me is like every tent's responsible for gathering its manna for the day. You know, there was no, it was not set up a system where you've got the manna gatherers. And they're going to go gather for the whole tribe or gather for the whole nation. There's no rich, oh, we brought a lot of jewels out from Egypt. You know what? I'm going to hire the tent next door. They'll do our manna gathering for us. Like, it doesn't work that way. Every tent has to have their people who go out and get the manna for that tent. Which... Um, Going to Paula talking about discipleship recently, right? This is the goal of evangelism, sharing the good news, is to bring in those and then lead them in discipleship to bringing in their own manna, not to be like, hey, I have words of life. Would you like to come eat from my hand forever and ever? because I'll keep telling you the things of the Lord. The goal is, hey, I can offer you some food so that you taste it 
know the goodness of the God and come in and get it from him yourself. Then the children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less, which Alice was praying. So when they measured it by omers, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. The commandment is to go out and gather, but there is no weight on your ability to gather the word of the Lord, right? He did not say, um, you know, you, like, you, you got to get out there and you got to get as much as you can get. It was go out, look for the word of the Lord, flipping back and forth here, but the daily bread, and I'll provide it. Like all the weight was on the Lord to go, I'm going to give you enough as long as you're doing the obedient thing of saying, Lord, I need today's manna. It is, it's really easy for us to fall into this trap of like, I'm not hearing the Lord and it's my fault. I just can't, you know, my, my ears are bad. But there is a place to have faith and go, but I'm asking, I'm still asking, am I, you know, like, am I still looking? Am I still listening? Am I still asking for it? Then let me be content and wait for him to fill my hand, my basket, my, my bushel. Omer, my Omer. Every man had gathered according to each one's need. And Moses said, let no one leave any of it until morning. Notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses, but some of them left part of it until morning and it bred worms and stank and Moses was angry with them. So this is, right, our f- fearful response. Time of famine, store up as much of it as we can. Or wait a minute, I gathered some a week ago. Let's go back to it and see if I can keep eating off of it. But the, he very pointedly set it up. It grew worms and stank. It's not meant to be a one time, let's gather it up, fill it up as far as we can, store it in a barn, and then we can just coast from here on out and not receive from the Lord. And that's where I see this load of scripture that is in our culture is no longer living, which is not to disregard scripture because the same verse that someone's quoting without the leading of the spirit, holding on to it because it meant something to them a little while back, is filled with life when the Lord's like, this is what I'm saying you today, today from saying to you today from Isaiah. So we can't live on yesterday's. But as the, the word of the Lord becomes scarce in the land, that's sort of the fault too. It's like ministries, denominations, congregations that have stopped receiving hang on to this old thing and eat from it, and it becomes corrupting instead of life-giving. which is just to cast vision for this place to say this is what we should be ever desiring. is like, what is the fresh? And to be guarded against going, well, this is what he told me. This is something he said. Like, is that what he's still saying? 1 Corinthians 2.12, we received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may know things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, nor can we know them because they are spiritually discerned. You know, like scripture is dead without the Spirit, breathing life into it, fresh. Even going back to uh, Jesus saying man does not live by his bread alone in that Matthew 4.4. 4, he's answering Satan, who's also using scripture at him, 
Satan's offering, dead words, without the Spirit of God. And Jesus is answering with quoting Scripture with the Spirit of God. Back to Exodus 16. I'm doing a lot of parenthetical jumping. So they gathered it every morning, every man according to his need, and when the sun became hot, it melted. And so it was on the sixth day that they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses, okay, wait a minute. (laughs) It stinks after a day. It's not useful anymore. But once a week, it's going to last for two days, and they get twice as much. Then he said to them, this is, in what, this is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today and boil what you will boil and lay up for yourselves all that remains to be kept until morning. I'll note that at least this first time they didn't intend to gather more than one day's worth. They had figured it out. Okay. Wow. That got gross when we tried to keep an extra day's worth. Let's just get the, the, the day's worth but they came back with two days' worth going, this is weird. Like, now we have two days' worth. What are we going to do? And the Lord tells them, let me interpret. I'm giving you a Sabbath. It's the entire difference between, I'm going to store some up so I don't need to get more tomorrow because I'm afraid, versus the Lord saying, I'm giving you some extra because you're going to need it for a little bit longer. which is just to encourage us not to despair. When he gives us the word of the Lord, and then it is the testimony of the believing church, of those who try to hear down generations, 2,000 years, that there are times where he stops talking. And I think believe he does that for a very specific reason, which is to build us bit faith in us. So his instruction to us is gather, keep gathering, but sometimes I'm going to give you a moment, a pause, where it's like, wow, the Lord went quiet for a minute, which feels like a year, <laughs> because once you've gotten used to receiving a fresh word of the Lord, having a little break is like, ah! <laughs> like it feels like it's going so much longer than it really is because we've gotten so aware of our need. So they laid it up until morning, and as Moses commanded, and it did not stink, nor were there any worms in it. Then Moses said, eat that today, for today is the Sabbath to the Lord, and today you will not find it in the field, according to the Lord's design, not man's. Six day you shall gather it, but on the seventh day of the Sabbath there will be none. Now it happened that some of the people went out the seventh day to gather, <laughs> but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for the Lord has given you the Sabbath, therefore he gives you on the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man remain in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Can anybody come to mind another manna that didn't rot even though it was kept? Yes. Exodus 16.32 Moses said, this is the thing that the Lord has commanded. Fill an omer with it and be kept, to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, take a pot and put an omer of manna in it and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations, not even an extra day. But as long as the ark was with Israel, there was that pot of manna. Why? so that they could remember, because there's going to be a generation that was not taught. Here, receive the manna every day. But they could look at it and get the lesson. They could go, let me compare. Oh, yeah, this is manna. To the manna that was given to my father. Um, We were praying on Thursday. Some of this stuff 
and specifically concerning Israel. And um, he showed me the Bible as this pot. You know, it's like the manna received by our fathers and our father's fathers kept fresh. It's not rotten as long as we approach it by the Spirit. But there's a place where we're like, hey, I got a pot, right? There's nothing else I need. And in that case, we can quickly find out how little life there is in it. Because it's all about connection with him, right? It was never intended to be like, here are the words that I gave these generations, and they should be good enough. That's all you got. I'm just going to be silent from here on out. Live off of it. That was never his intent. His intent is, here is the testimony of those who have gone before. Come talk to me too. And I will use their words to talk to you. And you can compare what you hear to the verified what I've said to make sure that it is not a spirit lying to you. But you still need to come talk to me. Deuteronomy 8. Starting in 6. Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of valleys and hills. So talking about that progression, right, from... Famine, go into Egypt. I've kept food there for you to eat during the famine. Two, I need to take you out of Egypt now. And I'm going to feed you in the wilderness. To now, I'm going to take you into a promised land. A land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates. A land of olive oil and honey. A land which you will eat bread without scarcity in which you will lack nothing a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. When you, we don't really talk about the, the minerals, do we? Just, <laughs> just realizing it's all about the big grapes <laughs> and the honey and the milk. Um, but there's even going to be some minerals there for you to mine. When you've eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he's given you. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you've eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, when your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you through that great and terrible wilderness in which were fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land where there was no water, who brought water for you out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you, to do you good in the end when you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. And herein is the danger um, that does lead movements, for a lack of a better word, moves of the Lord to get to a point where all the life in them turns to death, is that trickiness of our hearts where we're like, I'm doing good. You know, the Lord's been talking to me. And our hearts will take us into a place of like, I'm all set now. Psalm 37, 16. And I'm wrapping up here in warning to responders. Psalm 37, 16. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked, for the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. There is a promise, right? The Lord always shelters those who are seeking him. In the middle of his judgments, he 
instructs the Israelites to put the blood over the doorposts and the death, angel of death, goes past. In a place of famine, he provides a table for those who love him and want to continue eating. And we have it here, which is part of um, what I really want to share is just vision for the house of prayer as a feast that we've been given. Sunday mornings are weird. They have been weird for seven, eight years to me because I was really excited about being part of building a house of prayer. And in my head, I am not excited about building a church with all of the baggage of Western Christian church tradition, not using church as the Bible uses church, as we sort of colloquially in English use a church. And I have trouble seeing Sunday as something different than the thing we do across the week, but the vision is it's not. This is just a prayer meeting we come to together as a whole group once a week. I believe it's primarily here for unity's purpose. It's the same word of the Lord, presence of the Lord being poured out all across the week. It's the same antiphonal prayer is the point of Sunday. The one weird thing we do is one person gets up here and talks at us for 45 minutes, which I also come to realize is important right now, and I still think it's for unity's sake. Like, we get up here, say what the Lord's saying, but it's often what the Lord's saying through all of us all across the week in the prayer rooms, and it ties things together, and it gets us all connected in a way that we can't connect two and three at a time in uh, spots across the week. But the vision that I see for Sunday um, from the Lord is not, and that's, I mean, that's why we have an open um, mic during worship. That's why we get done with somebody talking at you for 45 minutes, with us talking, somebody talking, and then we're like, okay, let's play a little more music and pray some more, because that's really the vision that Sunday morning is just another prayer set that we happen to all join in on so that we can be a body better than um, in little disconnected bits across the week. So this is really the same feast being laid out of the word of the Lord. And um, the prayer room coming in across the week and coming here on a Sunday morning, the point is for him to talk, for the Lord to speak through each and every single one of you. And for the Spirit to release songs. Um, kind of woe that the prayer room should be converted into a duty that we're performing before the Lord. I mean, we come in to serve. We come in to serve each other and we come in to serve the Lord, but we come in to receive. The prayer room is primarily. A, his gift to us of a table laid for us to eat from. When my heart gets to the place where, it, where I think I am giving him something in the prayer room, I'm in a dangerous place. And he corrects me back on too. And I just want to I want to lay that out as a a renewing of vision as the word of the Lord is disappearing in the land. And it's getting rarer and rarer to really hear his, what he's saying right now. Although there's still a lot of teaching and a lot of scripture everywhere. Like this is a feast we should be treasuring and coming in realizing that it is a rare and beautiful gift. And I keep seeing it as a, a feast with a lot of empty chairs, 
over and over and over again recently, which goes to that doing the work of the evangelist and praying until like, Lord, it is sad that your feast is so, there's so much more room that people could be receiving, so that people are receiving. Just praying into that, like, Lord, fill the chairs at the table. Because I know there are some people who want it, who aren't here yet. Um, and to just exhort us not to be like, hey, we got some good words in the past. They laid a foundation. Let's just kind of walk them out um, in the prayer room until he comes. That we should have a vision and an expectation and an excitement that he's laying fresh food every time we gather together. And some of those dishes are dishes that were served eight years ago that were like, yes, this one again. I love this one. But there's also a bunch of fresh new stuff to be received. So, Lord, um, my res responders, come up. <laughs> Lord, uh, I just thank you. I, I want to keep thanking you. I want to overflow a grateful heart to the fact that you are speaking in this place. Um, when it is getting harder to find you speaking around the world, um, would you keep doing it? Would you renew just our value of it? Um, Lord, let me not rest because I've got collected some manna a day, a week ago, um, and hope that it will continue to sustain me I just say again, it is good to eat from your hand, Lord. And I just declare again um, that what sustains us is your word. Amen.